Should everybody be on one of these GLP-1 and an Ozempic form for their metabolic health? That's kind of a bold statement to make, and I wouldn't say yes to that. I was just trying to introduce a new way of using these GLP-1s that might be outside of what we know them for. Everyone's obsessed with weight loss, and they've really vilified it and polarized it. And I'm over here like, okay, can we forget about that conversation for a minute? I mean, that's awesome. And I actually will support that because not without the lifestyle factors, not as a substitute, but in conjunction with adjunctively, I'm going to give a patient every tool I have available to get them on the path, right? And there are actually metabolic healing properties to these GLP ones that people don't understand. So much controversy over Ozempic, right? right? Like most people are like, oh, you know what? Like it's a it it it's it's like the easy way out. Right. You're not learning, you know, how behavioral differences or, or habits. You're just kind of taking a shot to lose weight. Um, and you are on the opposite side of the fence, right? You actually, I'm a you're a big proponent of using these drugs. Well, I'm talking, I was originally about a year ago, I found all this data and literature, like 20 years of studies showing that this class of pep, they're peptides for one, they just happen to be owned by big pharma. Can you talk about what it is? Like what is, because I think no one really understands, like, is it a peptide? Is it a drug? Like it's a pep- start with what it, what GLP-1 is. It's a peptide. So it's a string of amino acids linked together by peptide bonds. So it's a peptide. We make GLP-1 in our bodies naturally, in our brain and in our guts. We have receptors for GLP-1s all over our body that do a whole lot of different things. It just was serendipitous that it got figured out for type 2 diabetes. It does a whole lot of other things in the body. And this was really interesting to me when I started studying it. It's a peptide in that it's in and out of the body very quickly. So the body produces it and the half-life is very short. The pharmaceutical version has been tinkered with so that the half-life is much longer. So the half-life is maybe four to seven days. So that's it. It's bioidentical, at least Ozempic, which is semaglutide, is bioidentical to our own GLP-1 for the most part. And about a year ago, I started finding literature outside of what most people understand it for. Most people understand it for reducing appetite because it plays on the centers of our brain that control appetite, for slowing gut motility so you feel fuller longer. And that's kind of where the story ends. That's kind of where people understood how it works. And that's why it's a weight loss drug. And that's why it's for type 2 diabetes. It has multiple impacts on our metabolic health in a myriad of ways that have a lot more to do than just that. And there are receptors in our brains, in our heart, in our pancreas, in our on our immune cells. And I started finding literature that was really, really interesting about this. And I started going on podcasts and sharing about it and uh, finding information like recent studies have come out showing significant reduction in all-cause mortality for those who are on it, Um, reduction in different types of cancers. What cancers? uh, Colon cancer, specifically. This was correlative, not causative, but they were finding, they were comparing people on semaglutide versus, or even some of the other GLP ones for a period of time versus I think insulin. And it's not a great, you know, I mean, it's not a super clear comparison because insulin is pro-grow. So insulin can cause problems in and of itself. But interesting data coming out there recently, uh, 13 different types of potentially reducing 13 different types of obesity related cancers. And then I was finding data and sharing out about potential protection against COVID and upper respiratory illness. And I was sharing about it on podcasts thinking, well, if anything, I'm helping big pharma sell their peptides, so they'll probably leave me alone. Like I didn't think I was a threat there, you know? And honestly, the the microdose is completely independent to the individual sitting in front of me. And that person, for that person, it might be the standard starting dose. Like that might be their microdose, right? So I have no idea. But then I started a second account a few days later, and it grew to 15,000 followers pretty quickly, and it was shut down within 36 hours. And that's when I realized, like, oh, somebody wants me to shut up. (laughs) Right, right, right. Well, I mean, if you're trying to take business away, who makes who makes Ozempic? Who's the company that makes Ozempic? Novo Nordisk, and then Monjoro is Terzepatide, and 
that's Eli Lilly. And so I, but I mean, I, I have no uh, interest in keeping people away from the standard. I, I don't care. What's interesting is when I started talking about this, I was like, you guys, I'm finding all this amazing literature supporting GLP-1s for neuroregeneration and decreases in inflammation and neural inflammation, which I think is really cool. That's where I got most interested. And potential, there's studies being done right now on potential improvements in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And like, this is super exciting, guys. And my followers, so many of them turned on me and they're like, when did you get sorry. They were like, when did you get bought out by Big Pharma? When did you become a Big Pharma shill? So they're screaming at me in my comment section, accusing me of being a Big Pharma shill. And I'm like, no, I'm talking about compounded versions, you guys. I'm not even talking about the standard brand name. But if you want to use the standard, great. And many of the people that I talk to in my following have said, you know, I could only get a hold of the standard brand name through my regular doctor through regular pharmacy and it's changed my life. So I'm like, cool. You know, I don't have any favoritism either way. Right. I'm just saying that if for someone like you, as lean as you are and metabolically optimized as you are, if you had maybe cardiovascular disease in your family or you were dealing with some kind of neurodegenerative condition, we would need tiny, tiny doses for you. So wait, like, so, so yeah, that's what's, what's interesting. So in your opinion, should everybody be on one of these GLP-1, like an anozampic form for their metabolic health? I think that I get asked that a lot. I think that's kind of a bold statement to make, and I wouldn't say yes to that. I think the way that I've always practiced medicine is I'm just trying to treat the person in front of me, and I'm trying. I don't use this in isolation. It's not a monotherapy. It's part of a comprehensive protocol. So I'm a big fan of bioidentical hormone replacement. I've been using it in practice for a long time. Um, my background was actually as a regenerative medicine doctor. So I was doing prolotherapy, PRP, stem cells, exosomes, regenerative therapies in my clinic for for decades. Like that's, so to me, peptides are just part another. of that. And this is just another peptide. So- But we, where did peptides even come from? I feel like pep, the word peptide has become- very popular, very um, trendy, in the, only in the last few years. Like before, like five years ago, I never even heard of a peptide. Most of my friends never heard of a peptide. And then in the last four or five years, it's, oh, there's lots of peptides that people are taking, the BPC-157, uh, the CJC-1290, whatever it is for all, there's so many. And I think Number one, it's inconclusive from what I've heard. And so people don't, there's not much to, but most people don't know much about them. Right. And so it's scary. Um, and and I don't even think people, the mass, I, and I only say that for people who are in my world, who are, are in the health and wellness space or longevity space or the fitness space. If I'm like confused, I can only imagine how people who are just laymen's like, you know, an accountant working at, you know what I mean? Or <laughs> right. what are we doing? Or someone in the yeah. marketing department at like Hasbro. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what do you know what I mean? Like, what, like, how do you even, like, I feel like, can you start from the beginning? Like, where did it even, how did it become even something that was even to be taken for optimizing your health or for your longevity? Well, these started popping up in the regenerative medicine space, at least to, in, in my, you know, when I caught wind of them, I would say 2017, 2018. And we were, we use them short term and we use them, we cycle them. So say you injured your shoulder, right? we'd put you on a stack of peptides to optimize your shoulder. I would probably do some regenerative injections. You can even inject these locally like to the injured areas. You, yeah, you could do however you want. They seemed quite safe. They're, they're strings of... Of, of amino acids and they insert themselves in. Many of them have anti-inflammatory properties. Many of them have regenerative properties. And when I say regenerative, I think people get confused. It's not like we're going to drop some BPC-157 on a heart cell in a Petri dish or some GLP-1 and it's going to make new heart cells. What I mean when I say regenerative in the regenerative medicine world is that often we're just abating pathology. So when you hurt yourself, there's a whole downstream 
process of cytokines and inflammatory molecules that happen as the body's trying to heal itself. And sometimes the body gets caught in a loop. So a, a herniated disc is a great example. The nucleus pulposa will squish out of the disc and the, it's called the annulus, the, the protective coating of the intervertebral disc. And it's not supposed to be on the outside. And once it's on the outside, the body freaks out and sends in everything. And that's why the initial injury hurts. And then two days later, you're like, good God, I'm really in a lot of pain. It's because of that inflammatory process. Your body's trying to wall it off, control it, contain it, and heal it. But sometimes people's systems go berserk and it's a horrible mess. And that horrible mess can actually damage the tissues worse. And so we are trying to get in there with something that's going to be anti-inflammatory healing and abate that pathological process and like slow the roll, if you will. And that's where I think peptides really shine. And so we have a variety of different peptides. In November, I believe it was, of 2023, all of a sudden there was a meeting at the FDA that, and I know people that usually are in on these meetings, and they told me like pretty secret meeting just happened, and many of those peptides got wiped from the, from for those of us who are licensed, we can only prescribe them. So I can only speak to the ones I'm still allowed to prescribe. So that's what I was going to ask you. So like so a lot of them you can't even get in California anymore, but you can get them in other states. Well, prescription versions I'm not sure about. And I know that there are places that sell peptides online still, and I can't speak to those because they're research labs for research purposes and not for human consumption. And I know that's where people are buying a lot of them, but I can't speak to that because I'm licensed to prescribe. So in Oregon, I can prescribe, there's a couple um, growth hormone supporting peptides that we still have left, like Tessamorlin, Sermorlin, we still have the GLP-1s available to us and via prescription, via compounding pharmacies, but even those pharmacies are getting in trouble. And it, For what? Well, other compounding pharmacies are turning on them and turning them in. It's really crazy what's happening right now. Like, it's really crazy what's happening. And I'm somehow caught up in all of this and my name seems to be circulating everywhere because I was just trying to introduce a new way of using these GLP ones that might be outside of what we know them for. That was all I was trying to get at. Like everyone's obsessed with weight loss and they've really vilified it and polarized it. And I'm over here like, okay, can we forget about that conversation for a minute? I mean, that's awesome. And I actually will support that because not without the lifestyle factors, not as a substitute, but in conjunction with adjunctively, I'm going to give a patient every tool I have available to get them on the path, right? And there yeah. are actually metabolic healing properties to these GLP ones that people don't understand. But over here, I'm like, look at this whole buffet of other impacts that I found data on. 